Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, historically, shop trading over the Easter period has been uh, a contentious issue. Uh, the current law allows shops selling certain types of goods, for example, dairies, service stations, restaurants, and cafes, to remain open. It's also had uh, several uh, historical exemptions, which allow shops in certain areas, such as Queenstown, to open on a Sunday, while shops in other areas cannot. This has given some businesses and areas an unfair advantage over others. For example, while Queenstown benefits from tr tourist trade on Easter Sunday, Wanaka, which hosts a number of events over the Easter weekend, cannot. The same disparity applies between Taupo, which has an exemption, and Rotorua, which doesn't. And there's no mechanism in the current Act to provide for further exemptions. As you may know, Parliament has considered various amendment bills in 2001, 2006, 2007, 2009 and 2012 to try and change the law. However, the only bill that was passed was the 2001 Amendment Bill, which allowed garden centres to open on Easter Sunday. That's why today, Minister Woodhouse has announced an amendment to the Shop Trading Hours Repeal Act. This amendment would grant local councils a limited power to generate... Uh, so Start with a long time. This amendment would uh, grant local councils a limited power to create bylaws allowing trading in defined areas on Easter Sunday. We believe local communities are best placed to make their own decisions on whether their local shops can trade on an Easter Sunday. That's why we believe the decision making powers should lie with them and not central government. I'll hand over to Michael now to outline the details of the amendment, then we'll take any questions you might have on those issues, and then I'll just come back on a couple of other things I want to run through. Michael, we're in your hands. Thank you, Prime Minister. As the Prime Minister said, the Shop Trading Hours Act Repeal Act and the broader issue of shop trading over the Easter period has been contentious for a number of years. The amendments we've announced today represent a sensible way forward which provide a real choice to local communities, businesses and workers alike. In the first instance, communities, through their local councils, get to decide whether they want to allow their businesses to trade on Easter Sunday. They'd have the ability to determine opening based on geographic areas, but not on an industry basis. These decisions would be made through bylaws that would no doubt be subject to local community consultation. <coughs> For communities that decide to enable training, trading, then of course business owners will have the option of whether to open or not. And finally, the bill will grant workers affected by these amendments the ability to refuse to work on Easter Sunday without giving a reason. The ability to refuse will also be extended to garden centre workers who can already open on Easter Sunday to ensure the law remains consistent. This is an important point and, those, uh, and will ensure those who want to spend the day with friends and family can continue to do so, while those happy to work can earn the extra money. As you've heard, we're only proposing changes to trading on Easter Sunday and not Good Friday at this stage. While there is greater demand from the public to allow for shop trading over the Easter period, for many, Easter is still considered a period of significance for religious or cultural reasons and this is particularly so for Good Friday. To allow choice for trading only for Easter Sunday balances those interests while recognising the special significance of the Easter period. Furthermore, Easter Sunday is not a public holiday, unlike Good Friday and Easter Monday. This means those who would normally work on Sunday are currently having to take a day of unpaid leave, whether they want to or not. I know there will be a lot of public interest and we expect a number of submissions as the bill progresses. Uh, the bill will be introduced in the next couple of weeks and go through the normal parliamentary process, meaning it's likely to come into force in the first half of 2016. However, as the bill requires or enables local authorities to draw up their own bylaws, this will obviously take a little time. So Easter 2017 is likely to be when we expect to see wider trading on Easter Sunday in communities if they want it. I'm happy to take any questions about the proposed uh, amendments. What about the timing? Is this just a diversion um, from health and safety debacle? <laughs> no, I've been working on this for quite some time, and in fact, um, we'd hope to have it up a little earlier so that we could get uh, uh, get it up and running for next year. But as you know, 
there have been a number of other, of other things going on in the workplace relations and safety space. Because it just looks really cynical. It just looks like you're just calling it a division because you're embarrassed by the fallout of what's happened. Well, we're not going to be avoiding uh, the health and safety reform bill. It's up this week. I think you'll hear from the Prime Minister, so I can hardly see how that would be a diversion. And workers will be able to claim compensation for the loss of the guaranteed day off. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Um, the PR that you sent out earlier said that um, workers won't be allowed to claim compensation for the guaranteed day off, so that effectively they'll, they'll lose out on that if they decline to work. Well, pr pr presently, if they take Easter Sunday off as a day they would otherwise <coughs> work, then that uh, would have to be a leave day now. So, in fact, it would compensate them for that, not punish them. How can you be confident that workers won't be punished for well, they will have the opportunity to take a personal grievance if they are asked to uh, work and required to work against their will, uh, or if there are other consequences as, as a result of them declining to work on that Sunday. There are pretty strong processes in place for personal grievance now, and I hope they're not needed, but they're certainly there. How hard will it be? What sort of process will the councils have to go through um, to allow this to happen? How hard, how much bureaucracy? Well, the bylaw setting process is pretty much laid down in the Local Government Act 2002, so I expect that will be the process that they'll be following. Uh, I think it'll be pretty, pretty clear, given the lobbying that's been going on from Rotorua and uh, Wanaka and their local MPs, uh, that they'll be first cab off the rank, and it'll be interesting to see who, who else follows. Do you think the uptake will be quite high, given what you're seeing around the country now? Look, I think in those tourist areas where there have been significant growth in, uh, in tourism, as you know, and in particular areas where they have special events over the Easter break, uh, like Warbirds uh, over Wanaka, which is a good example, I think we'll see quite strong interest, not only from the councils, but from the communities lobbying for it. Will this be a whip vote or a conscience vote for MPs? Uh, this will be a party vote by the National Party, so all 59 members will be in voting in favour of it, and I've had indications of support from the ACT Party and the United Future Party. Would you consider allowing public holidays for other religions? Well, at this stage, what we're doing is tidying it up uh, an area of long-standing uh, concern around Easter. I'm not aware that there are any uh, particular concerns around that, so there's no plans. Minister, three, three people have died in the quarry industry within six months this year. However, the main parts of the quarry industry that they work in are not deemed high-risk in your bill. Can you give a guarantee to families of those guys that were killed well, the issue of risk is one that's being addressed through a regulation that's to be uh, developed. The bill itself sets a very high bar for all workplaces, all industries and all workers to participate in health and safety and I'm satisfied that this is a significant improvement on the status quo. My question was about the families of the guys that were killed in yep. weekend quarries. Will you turn those parts of quarry into a high risk industry or not? My commitment is to make sure that the legislation when enacted is a significant improvement to avoid other families having to go through what those three families went through and I'm satisfied that we're well on track to do that. So the father of Pane Hill Ormsby who was killed, one of these guys killed, wants it to become a high risk industry. Will you make it a high risk industry or not? Because I, I, I can't. Well that's a process what, what that remains, that, what, but the questioning the, the question you ask is predicated on a belief that somehow being exempt as a small business from an absolute requirement to have a health and safety rep process when asked is some kind of uh, letting those industries off the hook or a watering down. I simply reject that. These are significant improvements to the expectations on everybody involved in health and safety at work to lift their game. That's what the Act will do when it's passed. Writing to both you and the Prime Minister today about making some further changes to the bill. What's your response? I'm sorry, to that? Felix, I didn't hear who was writing. Uh, Andrew Little was writing to both you and the Prime Minister, right. seeking some last minute changes in the committee stage. What's your response to that? Letter? Yeah, look, I've, I've heard his um, comments on QA and I, I respectfully hold a different view about what the bill will do. The existing Act in, uh, I think, Schedule 2A, which is entitled Worker Participation, speaks only of health and safety rep election process and the powers that they have. In the bill, there is a significant section on worker participation which sets a high bar for directors, officers, PCBUs, 
uh, and workers to work to a much higher level within those organisations and between organisations in the same workplace, for example in construction or forestry. I'm satisfied that that is a very high bar and that health and safety representatives will have a significant part to play in it. But the workplace is changing. There's a modern environment here uh, that I think is not conducive to only having a health and safety rep as the go-to guy. Everybody needs to participate in health and safety and that's what our expectations are. Do you, you think, do you think law drafts and, and indeed the government should have been more aware of the standards, the New Zealand Australian standards before things like worm farming and um, cat breeding were included? Well, as I've mentioned, my focus was very much on the, on the higher risk uh, industries within those classifications. I accept that uh, uh, another question would have been asked, could have been around um, things like worm farms and mini pup, but my focus was on the risk profile. In the belief, <coughs> and I maintain this view, that the exemption regime is not a watering down of the expectations on everybody involved in health and safety. Has your agriculture been dealing with low risk? Did you drop the ball on this? Did you fail to look at that list closely enough? Well, it was a process that is about to start. Uh, we're, we're about to pass a very important piece of legislation and we're about to pass a regulation. I gave guidance to the House last week as I committed to do, which wasn't the end of the story. Clearly there have been some anomalies highlighted. <coughs> quite open and relaxed about an exemptions regime as long as every industry and every uh, workplace understands whether or not they are subject to that regime and if, they're, if they are, what they're going to do in the alternative uh, to ensure that their worker participation requirements are met. So just looking at, just looking at sheep, feet and dairy farming which are exempt, right? Silage and hay come under high risk. So if a farmer is a sheep people dairy farmer, but if one of his activities he is growing hay and turning it into silage, and that's high risk, is that farmer exempt or is well, that included because he's a uh, risk activity? Workplaces will be guided by their ACC levy codes to establish which industry codes they fall into. So there'll be a way of reconciling that as there is now. So so how how, how does that farmer know? Is that farmer high risk or low risk? Well, they'll know what their ACC classification is. Why Could an agriculture be ACC claims to, um, to guide you on your taxonomy um, instead of work safe? Because, you know, at least for injury, at least that would be based on reality rather than, um, you know, bringing in some Australian yeah. classification. Well, that's the, that's the classification system ACC uses. So, in essence, we did. The question was, at what yes, level but should ACC we go? ACC only takes claims from New Zealand workers. It yeah. doesn't take claims from Australian workers. So it's going to be more accurate. Well, it uses the, um, the same descriptions to assess the levy setting process for ACC in New Zealand. The question that I had to consider with officials was, at what level in those industry codes should we go to to get the right balance of, uh, of um, risk without going too low and making them less meaningful because a one or two deaths or serious injuries in an, in an occupation could significantly throw uh, the risk ratings out. So I thought and still do think that the level three is the right place to land but there are some exceptions to that that we'll need to manage. Are you surprised at quarrying is not in high risk because you, you told the House, you told Parliament that you thought it was. Are, are, you, are you actually... Well, some, some is, uh, some isn't. The, the, the question again is predicated on a belief that, that, that quarrying is somehow off the hook uh, if, if they are subject to an exemptions regime. No, so no, we no, don't no, accept the, that. The question and for many quarries, they will have health and safety reps in the future as they do now. The question isn't predicated on people being hit off the hook. Well, that's the certainly how it's been described. Three people dying. Yeah. So, so the, the question is predicated on three people dying yeah. in quarries. In well, if, if you adopt that same logic, forestry would be out, and yet we know over a five-year period their death and injury rate is unacceptable. Their death rate has dropped 95% in the last 21 months. Yeah, I'm not and the serious harm rate has half, but nobody is suggesting that they I, should be out. I would never ever suggest that forestry should be out. No. But I'm just saying, do, do you agree that quarrying, where three people have died, that you might have to go back and look at it and it should yeah, and that's, and that's, the, that's what the process that we're starting now.
So it's, it's wrong at the moment? That no, I'm not saying it's wrong. wrong. I'm saying that under the guidance that was initially set, and based on the record of quarrying from 2008 to 2013, <coughs> they fell below the thresholds that we had set. Um, but as I say, and you pointed out, there have been three deaths in the last eight or nine months. Uh, so we'll be having a look at, at that as part of the, uh, the regulation setting process. Last, last month, last last month the agriculture was described to you, uh, sorry, last year, as the worst performing sector in terms of health and safety with more combined deaths in forestry, manufacturing and construction. So on that basis, how can that be deemed no risk? Well, firstly, the sector itself, the two sectors that are described, are significantly larger than those sectors combined and as a consequence have a death and serious harm rate lower than those other industries. Now, that's not saying that agricultural farming specifically uh, is uh, a safe industry and they have a very clear message that they need to lift their game. The question is how. We've introduced a number of initiatives to ensure that they have the best tools to be able to do that. The safer, that, that data came out of the Safer Farms program launch in February and March, which is a five-year program uh, and which has had a significant uptake. I've also, I'm working with industry to uh, resurrect the Quad Bike Safety Committee that was established in November 2013, a group that is designed to come to a shared understanding of what good quad bike safety on farms but, constitutes, but and that, that would be another significant initiative. Doesn't that show really that the methodology then can be flawed if you're looking at proportionate deaths to a certain number of people, that that's how agriculture remains outside the yeah. high risk, rather than actually looking at the 20 deaths or so that have been recorded each year in that sector? I think what it shows is that we need to be careful not to apply a one-size-fits-all approach to health and safety at work, because that hasn't worked and that there are a number of ways to deliver a safe workplace. Health and safety reps are going to be a very important part of that. More than 75% of workplace, uh, of workers uh, will be able to have one if that's their wish. Of the remaining quarter, I expect a very a significant number to have them, as they probably do now. Uh, but for those that want to exempt themselves, that doesn't let them off the hook. They'll still have uh, considerable obligations to participate in health and safety at work. Do you not accept that that really is an anomaly when you look at the number of deaths and the descriptions of agriculture in the time frame that you've talked about that farming sits outside? Re statistics regardless. Well, with you know, the corollary that, that there are some exemptions we need to look at, I do need to let the data guide that decision making. So is that one that could be brought in? You've talked about Well, that's a process that will start when the regulation is being uh, consulted on. So so federated farmers can... didn't seek an exemption from the safety rep requirement in their submission to the select committee, why then did you decide to exempt agriculture? Well, because that was the way it fell when we set the, the risk parameters. Uh, but as I say, there are a number of ways that uh, farms can deliver health and safety, depending on their size and risk. Um, they need to lift their game, and that will certainly be my expectation. Can we clear I'm aware can this can is your uh, press conference, Prime Minister, sorry. so I may need to defer can, to you. Can, can we clear up a couple of things before you go, Minister Woodhouse? Sure. Just applying common sense, can we clear up once and for once the consultation period is over, will mini golf be high risk? Just with common sense, will mini golf be high risk once the consultation period is over? I don't want to preempt that, but I think that's unlikely given given the, uh, so, the analysis. So you will, you will take mini golf out of the high risk category? Well, as I say, there's a process, but I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that common sense will prevail in that. And, and will common sense prevail with worm farming? Will you take it out of a high risk category? Can you say that today? Well, it's a little more complicated. What, and what's, what's and more complicated? The, the category that uh, worm farming is in constitutes, uh, constitutes a small industry grouping that has had 11 deaths and more than a thousand serious harm notifications. So I'm not going to preempt a further analysis of where those deaths and injuries are occurring uh, before I go through that consultation. Do you, know, you know how many deaths or injuries there have been in the wind farm? No, yet? that's the point. So we'll could be having a look at that. So could now, it, it may well be that that comes out as well. It's just that I don't have the sort of data that I have on... Uh, so so mini, golf, mini golf is not going to be high risk, but wind farming could still be I'm not going to preempt that process. Paddy, as I said, this is again predicated on a belief that somehow they'll be off the hook. Everybody's responsible for participating in good health and safety at their workplace. So could the farming category be changed as well if you're looking at 
mini golf, for example, could it work the other way that some could go into that high risk category? It, well, I'm not going to rule anything out at okay. this stage. This is a consultation process of an exposure draft that, that hasn't yet been finished written. So it's fair, it's fair to say, my, so, so it's fair to say, mini golf is probably going to come out and quarrying could go in. <coughs> is, that, is that how this is going to work? That's possible. That's possible. Prime Minister, I'm sorry, it's your post cab. I'll <coughs> no problem. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, so um, just moving on to tourism, as you've seen on Friday, figures released by Stats New Zealand show a record 3 million visitors came to New Zealand in the past year. This was a 7% more than last year, and those tourists spent a total of $8.7 billion, up 28% on the previous 12 months. This is a huge milestone for the tourism industry, and is a testament to the hard work going in to ensure that those who visit our shores have a tremendous experience. In the year to March 2014, tourism was directly responsible for 94,100 jobs within the industry and supported the further 72,700. It's also benefiting the regions with nearly half of the 7.16 billion spent by visitors being spent outside the major centres. The government will continue to work alongside the industry to build on this success and I'm confident that the best times for the industry remain ahead. In terms of the House this week, the Government intends to continue the Health and Safety Reform Bill. Wednesday is a Members' Day. Uh, as for my movements, I'll be in Wellington today, tomorrow and Wednesday. On Thursday, I'll be in Auckland in the morning before heading to Dunedin for a number of visits, and I'll be in Omaru on Friday. <coughs> it's a pretty stark warning from the Reserve Bank today, saying that the Auckland market poses an increased risk to financial stability. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I think there's a number of things. I mean, firstly, there's nothing terribly new in what the Reserve Bank is saying. It's been saying these things for a while. Uh, secondly, I think if you look at the responses from the government and the Reserve Bank itself, they're seeking to actually address those issues. I mean, it is ultimately, if you look at Christchurch, quite a good example. When supply starts matching demand, then you know, prices uh, don't go up anymore. And actually, over time, one of the things you know the Reserve Bank didn't say, but actually, frankly, they should have said, is interest rates won't stay low forever. So when people go and buy houses purely on the expectation they're going to get a capital gain, they've just got to be careful they don't come in for a nasty surprise. Just like those people who bought stocks recently and thought they were always going to go up forever, forever are in for a nasty surprise today. The other thing is the Reserve Bank did its own stress test back in 2014, I think, from memory. And it, it massively, as I said last week, moved all its parameters. So it basically said that if unemployment, it tested and it looked and said, OK, what happens if unemployment falls, uh, rises to 13% and Auckland house prices fall at 40%? And what it found out was that bank capital levels obviously reduced from 11% to 8%, but that's still way above the 4.5% that they would expect. So the banks are stress testing, Reserve Bank stress tested, yes, there's you know, obviously some more risk of house prices go up, but it is at the margins. The, the, the overall health of the banking system is very strong in New Zealand. How worried are you by the uh, global share market we're out with today? I mean, Shanghai off 8.5%. This is going to really damage confidence, isn't it? Well, it's a pretty significant day for the share markets, particularly in Asia. I mean, it's a reasonably big fall in New Zealand, but much more significant in Asia. And that follows on what was a big drop on Friday night in New York. I mean, I still think, if you look at the fundamentals of New Zealand, we're never going to be immune from those international sort of trends. And when you see a big day uh, down in the Dow, as we did last Friday, it was always going to flow into our market on Monday. Uh, but overall, the fundamentals of the New Zealand market are still pretty strong. And some of the things that have been driving the move down in the US and to a certain degree in Asia are less prevalent here. It's about the Chinese slowdown, isn't it? I mean, it's a much harder landing, and that is going to affect our exports and our economy. Well, I think in China, what you're seeing is you know, it's a mixed story there. Firstly, their stock market went up an enormous amount in quite a short space of time. So I think you have seen, you know, basically, you know, some, you're, you're, you are seeing some sort of correction in the Chinese market. I think the second thing to remember is that there is a difference, as I think I've said to you before, I think, about what's happening in China between the construction and investment side versus the consumer demand side. Our exports are much more heavily focused on the consumer <coughs> demand side, selling food and a number of other products to them. Australia's economy, for instance, is much more heavily focused on the infrastructure and investment side. So it's an arguably a bigger deal for Australia than New Zealand, but yes, it has some impact. The Reserve Bank talks about concern about a correction of supply outstrips demand eventually if you see the worldwide economic situation deteriorate combined with the um, local demand. Well, I, I just go back to what I said earlier. If people think Auckland house prices are going up forever, they're misguided. 
history tells you that's not normally the case that the market goes in one direction forever. I remember when, when dairy prices were $8.40 as a payout, people were saying they were going to the moon, and when they were down there at three eighty five, and you know these sort of levels you know, before the auction last week, they said they wouldn't go back up again. The reality is markets go up and down, but yes, if the, if the international markets stay, remain volatile, it obviously has some impact on <coughs> consumer confidence and can impact things. Just overall though in New Zealand, our economies are a bit more robust, we're certainly in a lot better shape than we were six or seven years ago, but <coughs> yeah, the volatile times on the international <coughs> stock market. Do you think we'll see an unusual line where it said that the housing situation in Auckland is keeping it awake at night? Does it keep you awake at night? Uh, it keeps me busy at night because we've been a very busy government when it comes to addressing those issues. Everything from special housing areas to reform of the planning laws to speeding up the, the process. And you actually are seeing that. I mean, you've got the most construction happening in Auckland now for a decade. So there's a lot of supply coming into the market. And there's a bit of frothiness about the Auckland market that I think you might see dissipate a bit actually. You can't the same thing in Europe. An income ratio of you know, what, was it nine to one? In in Auckland. Ratio. Yeah, but I mean, you know, interest rates are very low in, in Auckland. That's partly what's, you know, they're very low in New Zealand. That's partly what's supporting the capacity for people to actually borrow uh, and fund a house. But as I said to you, the banks and the Reserve Bank have stress tested those presumptions and, and those assumptions that are built into their uh, lending profiles. And for the most part, they're very comfortable. Given those stress test results, do you think the Reserve Bank might be overreacting? Yeah, I don't think it's overreacting. I think it's just taking a natural step forward as the government is with the bright line test uh, things we're doing. And the investors now account, account for 41% of Auckland House purchases. Where do you think they come from? Uh, I think they're largely local, to be blunt. Um, we might work to see in the fullness of time when we see the actual data, but but my own view is that your know, <coughs> some will be from offshore in the residential market, I reckon, both of them you'll find a New Zealand resident. It's always really a stress test that the Reserve Bank had tested the strength of the banking system. But if you saw even a small fall in Auckland house prices, that would be that would be bad, wouldn't it? That must does that Not, keep you awake at night? Well, in terms of for politically and for the economy generally, it wouldn't be good. Well, it? the government's preferred position always with these things is that there are there are rising house prices, but at a modest level. Um, and so, you know, if you saw a you saw a correction in the medium market. Median house price sales last month, and that didn't keep me awake at night. So no, that doesn't necessarily do that. I mean, it's if you get a really overextended market, then a big correction. But the point is, um, you know, the question is, will you get a big correction? Well, I don't think you'll necessarily get a big correction as people get carried away. But but I think you you run the risks that there's more of a correction um, if things carry on at the same price. What do you think the risks would be to the economy if that were to happen? Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's the well pronounced around the world if they get too carried away. I was thinking of the less threatened um, legal action over um, a claim he said that time we launched in 1987. Um, if the government uh, continues on with the surface land sale of the Auckland in response? Uh, well, my understanding is there's been, is, is this in relation to right of first refusal for land in Auckland? Um, well, I think there's been quite significant discussions with the various iwi. Um, participants and the government over the last month or so, so we haven't, we haven't seen any of those comments that I can recall being made to, to ministers, they certainly haven't relayed them to me, I haven't been in the meetings myself. But I mean overall, you know, the government is looking to move to develop more housing in Auckland and use some surplus land and we're going to try and take that, that program forward. So what's your response to getting into ATS land over well, you'd have to prove you've got a claim, and to prove that, you have to do two things in, in, from what I can see. Number one, you have to prove that you filed a historical claim prior to 2008. And the second thing you have to do is prove that you can get a mandate. So if he's doing it on behalf of the Kingitanga movement, they're neither an iwi a hapu or a whanau, so I can't see how they can do that. If they, and if they haven't lodged a historical um, claim pre-2008, then uh, I don't think they'd better take it forward. But Let's wait and see. The harbour's bit of, of um, the settlement process was always parked up for a while, so maybe that's what he's referring to, but um, if he's not, he'll have to demonstrate you know, exactly which bit of the historical claim he's talking about. Those tourism numbers you referred to last week, they yep. also showed net migration at a record high, and the Reserve Bank says migration figures are a factor in the Auckland market. Do you think there's a case for the government to 
tighten migration to try and help the Reserve Bank on that? Or There's a range of different numbers in there, but we sort of have a, essentially a target of about 45,000, no more than 45,000 new migrants each year. My understanding is that we're not, we're not bumping above that. That's about where it's, where it's operating. And it is largely, as people could see, not because you know, excessive numbers of new people are coming to New Zealand. It's because people aren't leaving. And you've seen that with Australia now, you've got that situation. And even Joe Hockey was making those comments in Australia this you know, today or over the weekend, that essentially you've got a situation where Australians are coming to New Zealand and New Zealanders are coming home. So it's largely about New Zealanders not leaving rather than an influx of new migrants. So why not reduce that 45,000 to help out? Because it's, it's really stressing the infrastructure. You can do, but you remember only half of them go to Auckland and quite a lot of them are already existing, and some of them are, for instance, gone through our universities and already have a job. And so you'd have to take them out of that job, and if they're in a skilled area, that may actually hurt the construction market, or it may actually hurt the development of the economy. So yes, it is a factor, um, but I think the answer is build houses. Um, that's, a, that's a better way of probably addressing it, uh, and we're doing that. Let's go steel is thinking of closing the Bedrock um, steel plant. Would that be a concern for government? Yes, but I mean, let's wait and see. Um, those those sort of <coughs> claims have been around for a long period of time. Yeah, as national steel prices are pretty weak, but hopefully they'll stay. Is there anything the government would consider doing to help them? Out? Well, I haven't raised in recent times that issue. There's been some discussion about jobs there, but but not necessarily closing. And they are well, that's news to me because I haven't been aware of that. So you think these are potentially idle threats? Well, let's wait and see. The, the basic line decision. Sorry, one more time? The base of the decision. Oh, right. I haven't yeah. seen it. I'm sorry. It's been rejected. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's You've been the one from some time Bible, ago? Yeah. That, that was some time ago, though, right? Or the, Friday. Oh, Friday. No, I'm sorry. Oh, it's been rejected. So, I mean, is the government likely to um, test it up the Supreme Court? Well, okay. I don't know. The, 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 the Attorney General have to see whether you know, Crown Law wants to take it forward. But, I mean, overall, our view has been that we need to have a, a response to the traffic issues that Wellington faces. Um, can't just sit there with no solution. And historically, when we looked at it, you know, other alternatives were really very expensive and very difficult to execute. So we'll have to see what the next steps are. The Corrections Department has been named by the Health and Disability Commissioner two separate cases where prisoners had received um, unsatisfactory health treatment. Is this, um, I suppose, a reflection on the wider prison system in terms of the treatment of prisoners? Um, it's always dangerous taking you know a couple of examples and saying that that's the standard everywhere. Um, we'd need to have a look at that and understand that. And there is a substantial number of you know visits and, and um, opportunities for people to register concerns that they might have. So the prison system is one of in New Zealand one of the most highly visited prison systems in terms of you know officials and others that have access and go there. So I wouldn't want to say that's absolutely the case, but again we're aware that we're doing for instance a review of Mount Eden Corrections facility at the moment. See what that throws up. So, just one more question on the basin. Um, yeah. I mean, as the longer that this drags on, the less likely it would be that this $90 million is going to set aside for it to stay there, right? Um, we need to find a solution. Uh, my understanding, you know, historically was the flyover was deemed to be, you know, by far the best solution at the you know, most affordable price. And that, you know, options of, for instance, tunneling and things weren't as realistic as some people would argue because they, I guess, you can do anything, but it was tremendous cost and quite technical. Do. So if it's not a flyover, I guess the question is, well, what's the next alternative and how easily can that be funded and, and how quickly can it occur? I just don't have answers to that at the moment. Do you know when they're likely to occur? Well, they're going to have to go away and think about what their next step is. Trevor Hockey is about identified tax cuts as one of the issues yep. and um, the discrepancy between tax rates there in New Zealand. Um, are, we, are you looking at potentially going into next election with tax cuts? Have you dreamed up your thoughts on that at all? Well, we'd have to wait and see. I mean, as you know, we've, we've essentially kept our new budget spending at around about a billion dollars for the, you know, the past budget and the next one to give ourselves, you know, theoretically room to have a tax cut package in 2017. But <coughs> there's a, and that, that would still be our preferred desire to have a tax cut package. But, yeah, we're not going to make that call this far out. There's a lot of different things happening in the world at the moment. And he's so, identified high worth Australians as coming over here, so there's some evidence to show that. Have you seen any evidence of that? Uh, well, certainly we've seen strong migration from Australia, and I think there are you know, plenty of Australians coming over, and as we see, I mean, net migration from Australia has been positive for the last four months in a row. Um, so I think there is, there's a function of a 
of a number of factors. You know, obviously you've got certain sectors slowing down in a more pronounced way in Australia. And certainly Melbourne is still pretty buoyant from what I can see, but you know, certainly in Western Australia, South Australia, maybe parts of Queensland, it's much weaker. So you're probably seeing some people coming back for that reason. Tax is, I think, one issue why people travel, but in, in Liverpool, opportunities is the main one, though. Can they find a job that will pay them what they want? Would a fresh you know, global economic downturn um, be one of those factors which could stop you from doing tax cuts in 2017? Well, I think we've always demonstrated over the last seven years, and we're going to continue to demonstrate we're good economic managers. I mean, over the last seven years, we've done a lot of things to get the books back, and we've made an awful lot of change. And it's been incremental change, but it's been the right thing. I mean, even things like this Easter Sunday you know, proposal is just a, a, a way of finding you know, a pathway through a difficult problem. We've done a lot of that across a huge number of areas in the economy. So we're always going to continue to work on doing that. I think, myself, we're much more robust than we were. Are taxpayers getting value for money from what he's spent on his website, $559,000? Yeah, I mean, my understanding of it, um, they are. I mean, for a start off, apparently it stops the website that they're running that cost 77600 so that's the saving they get there. I think they've amalgamated five websites, and it's a, it's a, it's a pretty significant site that communicates uh, with a lot of what MB does. So half a million, the sort of general feedback seems to be that's, that's not only appropriate, it's, it's pretty pretty reasonable value for money. Do you think there's a moral difference between bombing Iraq and bombing Syria? This morning you mentioned, uh, or related to a legal difference, do you think there's a moral difference? Uh, well, our, our actions that we take in Iraq are against ISIL, and whether ISIL operates in Syria or Iraq, um, they're still ISIL and their actions are, are abhorrent. But the main point I was simply making was that when it comes to Iraq, um, we, we went because the Iraqi government asked us for support and we thought that was the right thing to do. Um, in Syria the position's always been more complicated, so yes the Australians may be doing more there but they've got the sort of capability to do that and we don't have that. And secondly I think in terms of the commitment we've put into that part of the region, it's set in about the right place. So I don't see us changing as a result of you know the request maybe the Americans have got. We, we've allocated a certain amount of resource, we're doing a good job there but we're about right. TBP. Um, grocer in Kuala Lumpur. Any bilaterals with either Japan or America planned? Uh, I don't know exactly who's on his dance card, but I imagine he'll be talking to quite a lot of people while he's over there. And last year, when you were in Europe, you said that you were hopeful that a free trade agreement negotiation could begin this year. With Europe? Yeah. When do you think those negotiations actually will begin? Uh, I can't give you an exact date of that. I, I do know that um, in the last whatever it is, eight or nine months since then, we've been working pretty hard and we're making quite good progress from what I hear, but let's see how it plays out. Okay.